Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles. Could be any part of their past. It could be what's going on today. Sometimes we take a look into the future. And um, I'm Ken Michaels. This is one of the two shows that I do on the Beatles every single week. You might know me for my music Beatles show called Every Little Thing, which is syndicated around the world and on about 30 stations right now. And I'm being joined by my two other regular co-hosts. We have uh, the man who writes for Billboard.com and Access, AXS.com, Goldmine, a whole bunch of publications. He's also the author of uh, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. And that is our own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also have our resident musicologist who, for many years, uh, worked in the classical department as a writer for the New York Times. And he also has written a number of Beatle books, including most recently, Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. Also, The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop. And um, he also writes as a freelancer these days for the Wall Street Journal and other publications. And that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And on today's show, we have a special guest with us. And it's someone that I think most Beatles fans uh, are aware of because he's written a couple of very fine books on The Beatles and uh, I would also say essential books on the Beatles. A few years back, he wrote one called Liddy Pool, Birthplace of the Beatles. And uh, not too long ago, another one called The Fab 104. You've seen him at many Beatle conventions, including the Fest for Beatle fans. And he's always there, I believe, at the one in Liverpool, which would make sense, at the end of August every single year. And uh, that is David Bedford. Welcome to Things We Said Today, David. Thanks very much, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, Al. Hey. Hey. Welcome, uh, welcome, David. Thank you very much. David's with us uh, to not only talk Beatles, but he has a new project that he's been working on called Finding the Fourth Beatle. This is a documentary film about finding the person who would eventually become the drummer for the Beatles, really. And it was a long process in the history of the Beatles, as we all know. And I'd like to just start uh, the conversation by asking you the question, very simple question, but important. From the moment that Colin Hatton left as drummer from the Quarrymen to the point where Pete Best joined the Beatles, there were a lot of drummers in between, many of them for a very short period of time. Why was there always such a problem for the Beatles to get a drummer? Was it just that drummers might have been more scarce than other musicians? Is it because drummers might be more difficult than other musicians? Mm-hmm. Or could it also be that the Beatles themselves were a difficult band to work with? Oh, I can't imagine the Beatles being difficult to work with, can you? <laughs> not at all. No, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, it, it was funny. Every big sort of crisis the Beatles had seemed to revolve around the coming and going of drummers. So as you say, Colin Hanton was there, the first guy with the Quarrymen from 56 and summer of 58, Colin leaves. Now, between the summer of 58 and May 1960, they had no drummer at all. Mm. By the end of 58, they were basically that they stopped playing. They reformed in the August of 59 with Ken Brown on guitar. They had four guitars. Really, at the end of 59 and going to the beginning of 60, they think we need to have proper rock and roll band, which needs bass player and drums. So, of course, Stu Sutcliffe joins on bass. And then it was the May 1960 when Alan Williams agrees to become their manager. He gets them a a drummer called Tommy Moore. So Tommy gets in there, talented drummer. And there's only been a little bit of information on Tommy over the years. One of the things I've been doing over the last two or three years, I've actually have tracked down Tommy's family, neighbor, friend, to get a real rounded picture of, of Tommy for the first time. And he was a really good drummer went off on that little tour of Scotland uh, as the Silver Beatles, whatever they called themselves at the time, back in Johnny Gentle. Mm. As you may well know, there was um, an accident up there. Guitar case flew into Tommy's face, split his lip. He lost some teeth, ended up in hospital. John Lennon, with whom Tommy did not get on, 
dragged him out of his hospital bed and sat him behind the drums to play that night. Oof. Which you can imagine if you've got concussion, you don't want to be banging drums. <laughs> so they come back to Liverpool. Surprise, surprise. John and Tommy don't get on at all and Tommy quits. So that's him gone. Then there's this coming and going, which is a little bit mad. Just over a couple of month period in sort of June, July, going into August 60. So they turn up once without Tommy, but with the drums. And that's when this legendary guy, Ronnie the Ted, sat behind the drum kit and bashed away. What I have found out at the same time, another guy got up. He was only 16 at the time. He sat behind the drum kit for one song, realized he was rubbish, got off (laughs) and took himself off the stage. Um, the teaser he later went on to record with Apple who was it <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not going to tell you that one that's one of the teasers that's ah. one of the surprise guys ah, I see okay. oh yeah that, that's, you know what I'm like mm-hmm. you know that from the best so he, he's one of the little surprises in there of course Paul sits in um, for a couple of times especially back in Janice the Stripper for that week then they get this other guy Norman Chapman now, Norman, again, it's when I was doing the Fab 104 book, um, I found Norman's daughter and got the first photos and biography of, of Norman Chapman. Really good drummer. He fitted in very, very well. The other guys liked him. He should have been the drummer that went off to, to Hamburg. Then about a week before he was due to go, he got called up to do national service with the army. Ah. Yeah, that's one of those, oh, my goodness, can't believe it. Um, so with a week before they head off to Hamburg, they're without a drummer again. Now, a couple of things of interest here. We know there's about, about four or five years ago, there's um, a letter turned up, which Paul McCartney had written in response to an advert in the Liverpool Echo. And it was for a young drummer. They didn't know who he was and just said, if you want to come for an audition, ring us at the Jacaranda. By the time that guy rang, they'd already headed off to Hamburg. He left it too long. Hmm. Um, what I've also found out is that there's another guy who could have gone for an audition who was um, a friend of Jim McCartney's, um, but he decided not to, and he went off to the pictures with his girlfriend instead. Um, <laughs> yeah, another good one. But that same day that Paul wrote the letter was when he rang Pete Best and asked him to come for the audition. Pete came for the audition. He did a sort of a, a rehearsal come performance at the Jacaranda on the Sunday night and by the Tuesday they were heading off to Hamburg and so for the first time since Colin they actually had a permanent drummer in Pete and he was there as we know for for two years so it's a mixture of circumstances as to whose fault it was and wasn't Hmm. so uh, you do say that there there were 18 drummers all together right so from you, you're saying from Colin through Ringo, there were 18. Yes, yeah, to, through to the end of 1970. Yeah, that's okay. Well, to 1970 does, when the Beatles broke up. Yeah. Does that count, okay. Paul? Does that count, Paul? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we do count Paul. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then most of the other drummers were probably there just for a few gigs, then, right? Yeah. That, quite often it can just be one performance. Um, of course, we have to include Jimmy Nickel, who famously was in for. Yes, another drummer crisis. Mm-hmm. Of course, Ringo going sick just before the world tour starts. Uh, uh-huh. No chance of cancelling it. So, uh, so Jimmy sat in, as we know, um, and that in itself is is a fascinating story of um, of two weeks. First guy officially to be called the fifth, the fifth people. Yeah. Uh, now the um, press release for for um, the film says that Jimmy Nickel is in it. Does that mean that you got to meet him or interview him? No, no, it, it'll uh, unfortunately archive only. Okay. No, we we have been we have been trying to track him down, um, but of course the, the whole project is um, the book will come out first. Um, alongside the book will be a, a double CD, which will have as many of the drummers on as possible, um, and then the film will follow uh, after the book. So, how far along are you with the book and with the film? The film we're only just starting work on the book is going through its final edit so we have uh, we, we're self-publishing so it's up on the pledge music um, so people can uh, pre-order so that will mm-hmm. be ready in the first quarter of uh, next year 
All right. We do this as a roundtable, as you know, yep. David. So let's turn it over right now to Alan. Okay. Um, you know, the one, obviously, the, the, the two drummers, really, the people most think about are, are Pete and Ringo. And um, I think in Liverpool, from what we hear, there, there's a lot of, I guess, feeling of protectiveness about Pete. And um, I was just wondering, I mean, you know, Ringo was from Liverpool, too, obviously, but um, I was wondering, like, how that feeling sort of emerged. I mean, a lot of a lot of uh, other Liverpool musicians from the time have turned up in documentaries saying, you know, how good Pete was when the official story, really, and, and, and to some degree backed up by the relatively few recordings we have, which is the deck audition and the Sheridan things. Um, it was basically that Pete wasn't as n nearly as inventive a drummer as Ringo. So I was wondering what you, how you, how you stood on all of that, and also like w where the feeling in Liverpool comes from of uh, the protectiveness towards Pete. Yeah, um, yeah, good question. The protectiveness I, I deal with first is there was a massive shock in Liverpool when they found out that, that the Beatles wanted rid of Pete. Mm -hmm. um, from the fans, as well as, quite importantly, from a lot of musicians, and over the years of being in Liverpool, obviously I've got to talk to so many different Merseybeat musicians, and a lot of them, obviously they played on the same bill as Pete, they knew him well. They, I think, are fed up with, with writers really criticising Pete um, because they want to big up Ringo. And I'll explain why those two things are, are, are two completely separate topics uh, in a moment. In Liverpool, Pete was a highly respected drummer. Mm -hmm. Now, how I deal with it in the book, because it, this is, is such, it can be quite an emotive issue because I think a lot of fans um, outside of Liverpool are very emotionally attached to the Fab Four and you can't talk about anybody else. Whereas as a historian, obviously, I have to, look objectively at the whole topic so even though it's been written as he wanted to get rid of Pete to replace him with Ringo that actually is not how it happened and that's one of the big bits of the investigation that I've been well I, I've been doing ever since I started researching about 17 years ago it was never get rid of Pete to get in Ringo it was after George Martin made his comments to Brian saying he was going to bring in a session drummer Brian, John Paul and George decided they were going to get rid of Pete. That was one issue. Then they had to find a replacement. What I've then been able to find is, a lot of which has been out there for years, but just to corroborate it, is that Bobby Graham was asked first, and he turned it down. Richie Galvin was then asked, he turned it down. Johnny Hutchinson was asked, and he turned it down. Ringo was asked, and he accepted. So the two things are almost separate. So what I've decided to do in the book is... I put a chapter in which I've called The Beatles Are Dead, Long Live the Fab Four. Mm -hmm. Because for me, oh. you look at them as two separate groups. So with Pete, as they were coming to an end as a band, the Beatles, the rock and roll, the R&B group who conquered Liverpool and Hamburg, what Pete was doing, he was a great drummer for that band who were mainly doing covers. Mm -hmm. But they were doing that transition from great rock and roll act to performing, recording, pop group. And that's a different set of skills. And that's where Ringo is far more suited with his, his experience, his expertise, his background. And particularly this intuitive way that he plays. So for me, it's not Pete versus Ringo. And I, I try and drag the two apart because it isn't one for the other. You can't compare the two because for me, they're two different groups. I so that as as Pete finished, that was the end of, of the Beatles rock and roll group. And when Ringo joined, that was the beginning of the Fab Four and the, the, the two separate groups. That's interesting. Uh, and an interesting way to look at it. But, you know, there have been interviews where, and I was looking at a, a, a clip I saw on YouTube the other day um, about John talking about Pete. And he says, you know, we always intended to get rid of Pete. We just needed him... You know, we just thought he, he, we'd bring him to Hamburg and um, basically got him to give us a steady beat because he was relatively inexperienced. Not that they were so experienced yet. And, uh, and, and from his 
what he said, you know, obviously years after the fact, was that they always intended to get rid of him. And yet, on the other hand, you know, just thinking while you were talking, John also always looked back at the period in Hamburg as when they were really at their hottest as as a band. Exactly. And, if, and, if, and if Pete was... Yeah. So how do, you, how do you reconcile those things? And what do you do when you see comments like that from John or, you know, Paul's story, which I'm sure you've heard a couple of times about how the first time they played with Ringo, they looked at each other and said, whoa, this is it. So how yeah. do you, how do you um, like, how do you work with, you know, the, those things given the other information you have? What I, I try to do is I look for balance, I look for perspective and context. Mm -hmm. If a comment and an interview was given at the time, so if, if John was saying this in the summer of 1962, it would have a lot of validity. As a lot of his comments were given in the 70s, and it depended what mood he was in, I mean, he, he changed his story on a number of things. Right. And so I look, I look for a balance and not just one perspective. So I then find a quote that Tony Barrow um, who again, great guy, very close to Beatles. And John said to Tony, Pete was a great drummer, but Ringo was a great Beatle. Mm. So there's a balance. We've got Paul, who actually, when you look at the comments he's made, is probably the most honest because he says the problem with Pete was he wasn't quite like us and maybe wasn't the greatest in our eyes. That was a little bit, but in George Martin's eyes, he wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we thought, well, oh, what are we going to do? We've got to make a decision. Mm. And our career was on the line. So, and, and Paul, and as again in, uh, in Wingspan, in the documentary, he said, you know, he was a great drummer, but he just wasn't quite like us. Um, then you've got with George, his famous quote of Ringo was always going to be in the film. He just hadn't arrived at that time or whatever it was. It's okay. Mm. But then you, we have a letter which George wrote back to his friend Arthur Kelly from about November 1960. And he says, Pete Best is with the group, Mrs. Best Boy, and he's drumming good. Mm -hmm. So for each negative, they've also given a positive. So I don't want to just use one or other because that would be wrong. Therefore, if we're going to use one of the quotes, we use the other uh -huh. for balance. Okay. And therefore, you have to go for context, which is what were the people saying in 1960, 61, 62? Right. Hey, have you run? Have you um, run into? I mean, the the one thing we're really missing is a recording of the band playing live from around that period with Pete. Um, you know, the Hamburg recordings yeah. we have are with Ringo, and yeah. uh, so you you haven't run into anything like that, have you? Well, the, all we have, um, I think, as you mentioned, was we've got the Tony Sheridan recordings and we've got the Decca audition, right? Um, what I wanted to do was to do something different because I, I don't play drums. Okay, I can play guitar, I can play bass, I can play piano, I can't play drums. I've been in groups with different kinds of drummers, good and bad. So as a musician, you'll know, if you're in a group and the drummer is no good, you find that very, very quickly. Oh, yeah. It does not take you two years to work out your drummer's no good. Mm -hmm. So, but I thought, well, it, we're just going to end up with authors saying, well, Pete was good. Pete was crap, and stuff. So I thought, no. So I decided to do something different for this book, and that is, we brought in, I think it's about, I think it's eight or nine different drummers, and so I sat three down, of uh, different eras. So I've got one guy who played in a uh, uh, group in the sixties, uh, one guy who's right around fifty, and uh, another lad who's nineteen. All drummers, none of whom had heard the Sheridan recordings or the Decker audition. Mm -hmm. And I sat them down and then separately I sat down with a local um, record producer called Steve Levine, who's worked with some huge names like the Beach Boys and people like that. Mm -hmm. And again, I said, analyze this from your point of view. So first of all, I got the drummers and said, give me your feedback, like on the Decker audition, for example. And they all came up with slightly different stuff, but on the whole, Pete came out of it well. Which, which surprised me because I've always read that one of the things really bad about the audition was, was Pete's drumming. But they actually they said, no, the, the recording quality is poor, but that's down to Decker. So, but actually, his drumming comes out of it okay. Mm -hmm. Particularly when you think of how the others came out of it. 
I mean, Paul's singing was shocking. George's guitar work was a bit of all over the place. John was sort of here, hit and miss. But these are four young guys thrust into a huge studio for the very first time. Mm-hmm. So they were nervous. So you take all that into account. But Pete comes out a bit well, which sort of surprised me. Interesting. Um, yeah. And again, with, with the Sheridan stuff now, again, there's so many myths and legends and, and stories gone around about, um, like, with the Burt Camper take away Pete's bass drum because it, it, he couldn't keep time and he was awful. Now, some of that came from Tony Sheridan, who, alongside the Beatles, is one of the most unreliable eyewitnesses in Beatle history. <laughs> Um, hmm. But if you look at it and you think, okay, you've got some of the, the myths and the stories. First of all, Bert Camfort was the king of Schlager music, which was light entertainment. James Last, the big orchestra where right. a drummer was there for a bit of percussion, not for rock and roll. Uh-huh. So they were recording on a, on a stage in the school. I don't think, well, there's no way he's going to want a, a bass drum, particularly Pete Best atom beat bass drum. So you can understand him saying, I don't want that snare, symbols and stuff, that'll do me. So whatever myths and legends are around what happened in the recording, we have the recording to listen to. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're a drummer and all you have is your snare and or your hi-hat and a cymbal, you listen to the drumming on my Bonnie, that is phenomenal. It's absolutely brilliant. But again, I'm not saying because this is me, author. This is what the other drummers were saying and it is a brilliant piece of drumming okay so I didn't want it to be me versus whichever author I'm up against I want the feedback from drummers so that's what we've done all the way through not just for people you know for Ringo as well mm-hmm. because again with not being a drummer I've never listened to the Beatles songs for the drums right but for doing this book I've gone back and I've listened to the whole of the Beatles catalogue and listened to the drumming and suddenly you think, wow, I hadn't noticed what Ringo was doing. Right. Then when I start talking to drummers, they say, oh, yeah. It's... And suddenly it opens up a completely different world. And you think Ringo was the right guy for doing what they did for recording. Then he, all right, you've got the style thing where he's a left-hander playing on the right-handed kit. Right. And I've had that explained to me. And that... So that gives you a different feel for playing the kit for a start. Mm-hmm. The comment kept coming up, which was, Ringo knows how to play the song. Right. So I kept throwing it back to people saying, what does that mean? Uh And eventually I got an understanding of, and it's almost that Ringo would play how he was feeling on that take of that song on that day. Uh So you could do 20 takes and they would be different. And so what Ringo brought was almost the complete opposite to what a session drummer brought you. Right. The session drummer would come in and would do the same pattern a thousand times. He was this 1960s version of the drum machine. <laughs> he knew precise, accurate. But when you get someone who plays intuitively, like Ringo does, uh-huh. you get more feel in the song for whatever he was feeling at that moment. Right. And mm-hmm. I've, I've just got this completely new appreciation for what Ringo brought to the Fab Four and to the recording process. Mm-hmm. Huh. And I think as Giles Re- Martin remixes more of the catalogue and brings Ringo up front, I think more people will be getting that appreciation too, you know, because you can really hear what yeah. he does now. Anyway, yeah, so okay. I should pass you to Steve. Sure. Hello, David. Hey, Steve. One of the... Um things about the book that you've been that you've been talking about in advance of the publication is the fact that you feel that Pete didn't get properly sacked by the Beatles um, yeah. I mean you basically said to me that he didn't get sacked at all but, but really that that's I, I don't know that that's really true because he's you know he left but anyway talk about why you don't think he got properly sacked okay sure not a problem this was a surprise to me as well. It has been the story that's fascinated me since I, I started work on Liddypool all those years ago, was why did they get rid of Pete? You know, there's been books just on their own about Pete getting sacked, and mm-hmm. every time Pete's been interviewed, you know, he's talked about how he, how he was sacked. 
and he's given his account of the meeting. Brian's given his account of the meeting. And all, all of that is right. What, what Pete recalls and what Brian recalls, I, I don't disagree with any of that. What changed everything for me was I went to interview a guy called David Harris, and he was Brian Epstein's lawyer. And David drew up the first management contract that Brian didn't sign. So I, I talked through that with him. But when George Martin had made those comments to uh, Brian Epstein after the 6th of June uh, session down at EMI Studios, Brian went to his lawyer and said to David, said, right, we need to find a way if we get this recording contract, we need to find a way to get rid of Pete. How do we do it? And so I'm having this conversation uh, with the lawyer. Um, and there's a couple of things that had come up in Mark Lewison's Tune In book. And I said, uh, I just want to ask you around that just so I could understand it a bit better. And once we got into the conversation, it went down an avenue I wasn't expecting. Um, and a, a small advantage I've probably got is that in my previous existence, I worked in insurance and I did a, a couple of qualifications in contract law and English law. And so I was asking him some more technical legal questions and it suddenly dawned on me that everything that was in front of me, I, I sort of looked, looked at the wrong way. And what David Harris was saying to me was, what you have to understand is that from a, a legal point of view, John Paul George and Pete were a legal partnership. And what I also found out was that they actually signed a partnership agreement at the end of 1961, which nobody had discovered before, which sort of matters, but in a way it doesn't. So John Paul and George and Pete are a legal partnership. They employed Brian as their manager and agent. So first of all, Brian has no authority to sack Pete. He cannot say to Pete Best, right, I don't want you anymore. You're out of the band. He, he can't do that. Pete and the Beatles could get rid of, of Brian, but not the other way around. So if you go back and you, you read exactly what Pete and Brian always said about the meeting, Brian at no point tells Pete he's been fired or he's been sacked because he can't. Legally, the only ones who can get rid of Pete are John Paul and George because they're in a, a legal partnership. Now, to do that properly means to dissolve the partnership. That could take weeks, possibly months, depending on the, the legal arguing. And the Beatles didn't have weeks and weeks and weeks to drag out a legal battle, because of course, they were off to um, Abbey Road in a couple of weeks time. So you've got Brian who can't sack Pete, and you've got John Paul and George who don't want to dissolve the partnership. So when you go back and you read what was said, Brian says to Pete, don't know how to tell you this, but the boys want you out. That's sort of this is notice from your partners that they don't want to work with you. And it's already been agreed that Ringo's joining on Saturday. So Brian had to use those words very, very carefully because he had to make Pete think that he was being sacked, which, of course, is what Pete thought. Now, if at that stage Pete had said, that's very interesting, Brian, I'm going to speak to my lawyer. What could Brian say? Well, nothing, because Brian had no authority to make any other decision. So that could have then become legally quite messy. But of course, Pete being what, 21 years old, he's not going to know legal processes and stuff. Um, so he takes the assumption that he's been sacked, even though he hasn't. Now, because of the management contract, Brian is still responsible to provide work for Pete even if he's not in the Beatles. So Brian then suggests putting him in with the Mersey Beats. Now, at the time, Tony Crane, Billy Kinsley are 16 and 15. There's no way Pete's going to do that. So Brian has spoken to his, his very good friend, Joe Flannery, and says to Joe, why don't you invite Pete to join your new, new group, Lee Curtis and the All-Stars? So Joe asks Pete, and Pete joins Lee Curtis and the All-Stars. By Pete quitting the Beatles and joining Lee Curtis and the All-Stars, he takes himself out of the Beatles. Huh. Hmm. So at no point has anybody told Pete he's been sacked, but Brian's implied that he is because Ringo's coming in as a replacement. But Brian can't actually say to him, you're fired. 
got no authority. That's uh, that's pretty uh, earth shaking as far as as far as the story goes. Um, I'm, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Alan and Ken come in because I have another follow up. Um, but uh, you guys want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I mean, yeah, presumably you've run this uh, perspective past Pete, right? And um, Pete's not interested in anything, but I've, I've run it by Rogue. Uh huh. Yeah. Pete, really? Ah, uh, interesting. Because nope. I, nope. I was be, would be curious what Pete had would have to say about the fact that you know, in a way, he sort of allowed that to happen, and you know, obviously he, you know, as you say, was twenty one and didn't know stuff. But um, exactly, yeah, it's a kind of an interesting thing. David and I have talked recently, and and we had this discussion, and I went over this with him quite a bit as to how Pete could could let this happen. It was pretty, yeah, yeah. It is pretty astonishing, but Brian apparently convinced him, you know. Yeah, so. and he has, he has to use the right words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I was wondering, Ken? you know, what they Go felt ahead. now. Mm-hmm. Say, how does, how does, how did, you said Rogue, uh, you ran it by Rogue, David. How, did, how does he feel about it? He says, now it all makes sense. I completely get it. Hmm. It, it, it took, once it took him through because the evidence and that's what I always follow is I follow the evidence and the only evidence says they didn't look to start to replace Pete until after that comment from George Martin at the end of the EMI session mm-hmm. everything follows from that now to, to put it in the shoes of John Paul and George now at the end of that session George Martin is saying that if we decide to make a record, and it's still not decided yet, you haven't got your contract yet, if we make this record, I'm going to bring in a session drummer. Now, that was standard practice back then. Mm-hmm. But, of course, Brian is naive. He doesn't know how these things work. And obviously, John Paul and George wouldn't. So Brian goes to John Paul and George and says, OK, guys, George Martin said Pete's not good enough to play on the record. Now, again, if you look at, at Paul's comments, I think they're in anthology. And he says, and we think to ourselves, oh, God, what are we going to do? This is our last chance. Can we do it? But this is our career on the line. So I don't blame John Paul and George because this is the very, very, very last chance of getting a recording contract. And they're this close that the producer doesn't like the drummer. What do they do? They felt they had no option but to find a replacement for Pete. So, again, you can, if you get yourself in their shoes, you can understand the panic. Mm-hmm. And why they, they took that decision. What I find interesting is what you had said, David, about Brian consulting with his lawyer. What do we have to do to get Pete out yeah. of the group? So in order for him to say that, that must mean that John, Paul and George wanted Pete out. Yes. And yet yeah. at the same time, you just said that the four of them, John, Paul, George and Pete, signed a, an agreement, a mm-hmm. partnership agreement at the end of 1961. Yep. So maybe something had transpired from that moment through June 6th of 1962. And also, and I've been thinking about this myself, because the Beatles were turned down by every record company in England, including EMI, before this. That's so right. this, was, this was their last chance. Absolutely. So they're going to do whatever the record producer wants them to do. But at the same time, my question is that I had heard that it wasn't just George Martin, but Ron Richards the engineer yeah. who didn't think much of Pete Best as a drummer either, but they never said to the Beatles, you have to get rid of Pete Best, period. He could have right. been with them for live performances, and they could have had a, you know, a session player on their studio recordings. That's so the mere fact, so that what they did, at least this is how I interpret this, is that they used this as their excuse to get rid of Pete. Okay, two things, yeah. Ron Richard, yeah, he, he, was the guy, he oversaw the session, and he has said... He asked Pete to do some stuff, which he couldn't. But then he also said, if I'd have asked Ringo to do the same thing, he couldn't have done it either. Um, But Ron Richards' opinion mattered. He discussed it with George Martin. George Martin told Brian. And you're getting Chinese whispers by the time he gets to John Paul and George. Um, Studio practice, as you know, was session musicians. You look at someone like Bobby Graham, for example, who played on something like 15,000 songs, about 50 of them were number one hits. You know, session drummers in particular were, were commonplace. Mm-hmm. So we know that the discussion when Brian speaks to his lawyer 
takes place about 10 days after they come back from the June 6th audition. That discussion hasn't happened at any other time. And I, this isn't coincidence. And it crops up again in one of the conversations when Peter said what happened in the meeting. And he said, why, why are they doing this? Brian says to him, well, George Martin doesn't think you're a good enough drummer. So the evidence is all saying everything links to what George Martin said. Now, on your, your other point, which was they use this as the excuse to get rid of Pete. What, what's your evidence for that? That they wanted Pete out. By the mere fact that you just mentioned that Brian said to his lawyer, what do I have to do to get Pete out of the group? Yeah, because they decided after the June 6th audition, if George Martin didn't think Pete was good enough. Oh, okay, that was after June 6th. Yeah, yeah. So okay. well, they had that discussion after June 6th. And as Paul said in Anthology, you know, they were bothered, but they realized they had to do it for their career. Mm-hmm. So following that discussion, Brian speaks to his lawyer. So it only starts after George Martin's comments on June 6th. I've got, I've got no evidence I've come across, apart from anecdotal, that John Paul and George wanted Pete out of the group. But everything else that we've heard through the years about personality-wise, Pete didn't gel well with the other Beatles, that he was much more quiet. Sometimes he was by himself. He wasn't hanging out with the other three. That, in any way, you don't think that was an influence? The way I see it is there's a primary reason and there are secondary reasons. The primary reason is, as we've just been saying, what George Martin said. Now, going on what Paul had said, you know, they sit there and they discuss and think, can we do this? Should we do this? You know, it's a hell of a position to be in. Okay, if we do this, is it for the right reasons? What's the advantages, pros and cons? That is when I think there is a second discussion which follows on, which is, well, for Brian, that gets Mona best off your back, doesn't it? Um, And, uh, you know, he doesn't always hang out with us. Um, and the secondary reasons then come in. And again, you talk to anybody who's ever been in a band, how important personality is and gelling together. And if band members don't get on, it doesn't make for a good a good group at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see secondary things. But again, were these things said in 1961 and 62 or afterwards? Because, you know, if we are honest, one of Brian's greatest skills was his PR of the Beatles in that they were only ever John Paul, George and Ringo. He was their manager. Nothing else came before. It was protect the Fab Four. So I think there was a lot of that and there's been so many interviews and reasons given post-62, which are to denigrate Stuart Sutcliffe and to denigrate Pete Best for the good of the Fab Four. Now, I'm not disagreeing with their decision because I can see why they decided to do that. Because as we were just saying, this was their last chance. And and also I think in any band's evolution, when you look at, you know, the quarry men were doing okay, but they couldn't go any further. Then they get Paul in and they start doing better. Then they need a lead guitarist to get George in. Every time you want to make a step up, sometimes you need to replace a band member. And I think to make that leap from where they were as a, a covers band, a rock and roll R&B band, to recording stars, they needed someone with the techniques that Ringo brought into it. But of course, from everything we've seen, do we know that's how they thought at the time? They didn't know what recording was all about. But Ringo proved to be the right one. Okay. No matter what, it's very complex, this mm-hmm. whole part of the Beatles story. Because... Um, You know, what about all that you hear about how Ringo was so comfortable when he fit in with the Beatles even before he was hired to replace Pete Best? And uh, you know that George Harrison in particular lobbied for Ringo to be in the band. He He really wanted Ringo in there. So I think it was, you know, a combination of a lot of factors. But would you say, and this is a very tough question here, David, if George Martin didn't say this at the June 6th session about Pete Best... Would he have stayed? Yeah. You think he would? Yeah, yeah, I do. Be- because I, d- I can't see why they would have got rid of him because all the stuff for saying that Ringo was always going to be in the band, that it was get rid of Pete, bring in Ringo, 
I want the evidence and I don't see the evidence. I see post-62 anecdotal evidence, but I, I don't see firm evidence because a lot of the time Ringo wasn't around, don't forget, because Rory some of the Hurricanes were off playing at their summer camps. They were doing different tours and stuff. They weren't in Liverpool a hell of a lot. So they would hang out sometimes, but all the bands were hanging out together. So they'd become, they'd become friends out in Hamburg in 1960. But I don't see much evidence that there was any great close friendship. George had started becoming friendlier with Ringo in for the springtime of 62, when Ringo had come back from being with Sheridan Band in Hamburg and before rejoining Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. So they'd started becoming friendly, but I haven't seen much evidence. And that, that's what I really want, is I want evidence of saying this is what happened. Now, the only evidence we do have, and I think it's, it's important evidence, is that between December 61 and when Ringo joined, there were, I think, three occasions when Ringo sat in in Pete's absence. Now, I think that definitely helped them because they played with him. You know that they played with other drummers. They, they played now in that six-month period on uh, three different dates. One of them, he, he played two, two gigs with them. So I think they got to play with him and they liked the way he, that he played. Mm-hmm. But why then, when the contract comes through from George Martin at the end of July, the first thing that Brian does is approaches Bobby Graham. And you can sort of understand why they went for Bobby Graham, bearing in mind George Martin's comments. Because Bobby Graham was, first of all, he was a session drummer, so he used to play in the studio, but also was on tour with Joe Brown the Brothers. They'd had the number one hit. He was on a UK tour. Surely he would fit the bill for what George Martin would want. Then, of course, Bobby Graham turns him down. Then they approach Richie Galvin, uh, Vail Preston and the TTs. Richie turns him down. And then he approached Johnny Hutch. Johnny Hutch turns him down. Then he approached Ringo, and Ringo accepts. Now but is that, is that who Brian wanted, or is that who John, Paul, and George wanted? Did they want those drummers? Did they request those drummers? I cannot imagine for a second that Brian, who is not even a musician, would do anything without their authority. Now, what we do know is that Brian consulted with Bob Wooler, and... The, the boys trusted Bob as did virtually all the musicians back then. So I, I can't see a situation where Brian would go and ask someone to join a group without discussing it with John Paul and George and having their authority to do it. Um, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Mm. I, can't, I can't see that. Okay. David, um, was there a transformation of Ringo between his... Well, you, you said when Ringo joined, they became the Fab Four... Mm. Was there a transformation? Did Ringo was Ringo different before he joined the Beatles? I mean, what was what was he like? You know, when he was Rory, when he was with Rory Storm and earlier. I mean, what 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 was? It? I mean, he was turned into a personality when he joined the Beatles. I mean, how was he? How was he before that? Virtually the same. The difference, if you want to look at the different backgrounds for for Peter and Ringo, Peter only started drumming, um, sort of late 59 been playing a bit of the Casbah and around there most of his experience was built up with the Beatles out in Hamburg whereas with Ringo he'd started with the Eddie Clayton Skiffle group in 1957 so he was playing Skiffle and a bit of the jazz a bit of swing that group then went from Skiffle into a bit of rock and roll rockabilly a bit of country Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and of course he had his own um, star time so he became Ringo Starr, the personality within Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. So he was already standing out a bit. And before the Beatles came along, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were the top group in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. When he, even you go back to the Eddie Clayton Skiffle group. Now, they are one of the top Skiffle groups in Liverpool. So Ringo went from one of the best Skiffle groups to one of the best uh, rock and roll groups in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. And then into the Beatles. So he's got a pretty good track record. With that kind of background... And I think one of the things particularly he learned to do with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes was with them playing uh, like at the Butlins holiday camps, that's not heavy four to the floor 
get your head down and headbang rock and roll. That's family entertainment. So you need a more varied style, varied um, song list. And so Ringo had a lot more experience in a wider variety of song types than Pete had. Now, an interesting conversation I had was with Billy Kinsley from the Mersey Beats. And of course, Billy went down, he, he recorded with Apple, um, and he also played in the Pete Best Band. So he, he's got a, a real good insight. You know, he would say what a great drummer Pete was for what he was doing back then. You know, no problems with that. But also, having played with Ringo, and said you know, he was, Ringo was exceptional. And he said one of the things he noticed, what was happening to the Beatles in 1962, which is sort of going back to that, the Beatles are dead longer than Fab Four thing. There was a change in the musical progression and possibly a bit of a power swap from John to Paul. They were starting to introduce more of the ballads, more sort of show songs, the lighter side of the music and do less of the the heavier thumping rock and roll. Mm -hmm. So the group in itself was evolving. And part of that, of course, was down to Brian. Because Brian wanted to get them out of the suits, uh, sorry, out of the leathers, into the suits, out of the rock and roll clubs, into the theatres, which didn't always work, but it was part of their progression. And this was part of the, in a way, the genius of Brian, to look at them as a musical act, to know that if they didn't make these changes, they would never get out of Liverpool. And so you've got this whole transition going on in 1962. In some ways, I call it rocked in, popped out. And it starts <laughs> mm-hmm. this, this rock and roll group at the beginning of 62. By the end of 62, they're a pop group and they're playing different songs, different kind of music. And that was this whole transition in 62, which was a fascinating thing. And I think that's where they got as far as they could as John Paul, George and Pete to make that step up. They needed someone with a wider skill set. And that's what Ringo brought. He had that variety and, again, going back to that intuitive play, playing the song. He knew how to sit behind the song and do something simple yet creative. And it's, it's funny, with all the drummers I've spoken to, the number of times they've said they hate people saying the phrase, well, Ringo, he wasn't technical, but... And he said, why do people need to say that? You could say, you could say that, well... John Paul and George didn't read musical, so technically they weren't very good. But <laughs> why but, say but, it? But to be fair, Ringo himself has said that I'm not a technical yeah. drummer. So yeah, but, but, but again, it mm. depends what you, you define as technical. Because if you know, I was, I was looking back at the um, that short film they made for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with all those different drummers. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, about, mm. and if you think of the stellar names who were there all who were influenced by what Ringo did. Sure. That's what I was desperately trying to find out. Why does everybody say that? Is it just because he was a Beatle and it's cool to say it? Or what did they mean? And that's what I've been getting to. And that's what I feel I've got a much greater understanding now mm-hmm. of Ringo's contribution to, to what the Fab Four did. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Two, two of the people that are involved in the book are Alex Kane and Terry McCusker, who put out a book called Ringo Starr and the Beatles Beat yep. that's available in hardback on Amazon. Um, but I got the, the, a two-part ebook uh, through iTunes. I don't know if it's still available. But I've, I'm sitting here looking at the uh, index, and they go through – they analyze heavily his I mean it's a deep analysis of Ringo's drumming and it has charts and everything just talk about them for a second because uh, you were you were telling me that uh, that uh, I believe Terry Terry saw the Beatles at the cavern or they both did yeah, yeah Terry did yeah it's a fascinating book because what they've done is because they're both drummers they've analyzed every song the Beatles recorded and they've looked at what Ringo was doing so they've analyzed um, his drumming um, what instruments he used, how he used them, and what he was bringing to the creative process. And in a way, it sort of takes you beyond Ringo being just a drummer, but to being a percussionist. Because you start seeing some of these weird instruments I've never heard of um, that, he, that, that he was using and being so creative. And he suddenly realized in a song, he could be using you know, two or three different time signatures. You now, John Paul or George would come to him and say, We've got this song and it messes around. And it, it's 
it's not straightforward and he'd get it and so it was interesting talking with, with Terry McCusker because um, Terry did he saw uh, the Beatles with Pete and was sort of inspired to become a drummer but then he saw the Beatles with Ringo and he saw the difference and he could then explain again going back to almost what I, I was saying before that for what the Beatles were doing with Pete at the time Pete was a really good drummer fantastic driving Pete you know and when you you combine that with Paul's thumping bass with these huge bass speakers that they had. You know, the sound was incredible, but that could only get you so far. And that's why Alex and Terry did this book, because they thought, well, nobody's given enough attention to what Ringo did. And they tried to highlight what Ringo contributed to the creative process of these songs. And that's what made me go back and, and re-listen to all these Beatles songs and just listen for Ringo's drumming, because some of it, some of the obvious ones, you know, like Strawberry Fields Forever, it's like that. the drumming's quite obvious. Other things are a lot more subtle. And so they've helped a great deal in helping a non-drummer understand what Ringo was doing. It's very important to have a book like that out because I think there are a lot of music fans who are so impressed more by Flash yeah. and by musicians that, that do a lot of solos and mm. extended oh. solos. And Ringo knew just how to, you know, accent the song and play interesting fills that made it all musical. And I got to tell you one thing on this subject. I have a son who plays a lot of instruments and he's a great drummer. He really is. And there are times when he plays Ringo's part. And yes. this is completely by himself without a band. And you know what the song is just by the yeah. drum part. Yeah. And that tells you something, how distinctive the playing is right there. If you can identify a song just from the drumming on a song, you exactly. know, it makes you realize how, it, how ingrained it must be in your brain without you realizing it. Exactly. And on that, that very subject, what I, I wanted to do then was, as well as talking to people like Alex and Terry, I've interviewed a couple of drummers who have been in Beatles tribute bands. I said, OK, what's it like as a drummer trying to learn Ringo's part? And one of the, the funniest stories seems to be a repeating one is you listen to the song and you listen for the drumming, and then, as you say, Ringo's the, what's it, um, the king of feel, I think he's one of those uh, late Abel Laborial, I think, said, and he, and he plays this little fill, he said, so, and you learn it, then you think, I've got it, I've got it sorted, and you play the song, three quarters of the way through the song, where you think the same fill will appear, is something completely different, because mm -hmm. by then, Ringo thought something better would fit in, so he plays something different, so not only from take to take, could the drawing be different? But you wouldn't even do necessarily the same fill in the same song. So it's really hard then for drummers to try and learn Ringo's part and said, even if technically you can reproduce it, there's something about how Ringo plays that you can't reproduce the feel. Huh. I think what, one of the techniques he'd learned is he plays com often coming out of the, the beat, not going into the beat. Now, it's yeah. something that can happen in a split second but it can really alter the sound that you can get. And so you start listening then for the drums as an instrument, as much as changing the sound from playing a, a Fender Telecaster to a, a Gibson Les Paul will give you a different sound. Mm. It's what Ringo was doing with his drums. and Because, you know, he only had a very basic kit, and he, he never liked anything more than that. But he then developed ways of using tea towels and blankets and, to muffle the sound, and just change the tuning to give him a completely different sound with the same kit. Right. So he, he was do, doing so many things like that, whereas you know, most of the drummers at the time, they get the kit ready and they just play it. Yeah, it's very hard to duplicate what Ringo did on the drums, yeah. because even yeah. if it's slightly off, if you've mm -hmm. got good ears, you'll notice the difference. Yes. And, and exactly. you notice that in so many Beatles tribute bands that are out there. I yes. just want to ask you a question that really, that this has nothing to do with Ringo. But it's because of the fact that you were born in Liverpool. You still live there. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just very briefly say, has Liverpool changed all that much? Aside from the fact that it's become a big city because of the Beatles and all the money that they brought in. But the suburbs and the towns that the Beatles lived in, in particular Walton. Allerton, Speak, the Dingle, which is where you were born, right? I'm a Dingle boy, yeah. Yeah. Are, are they pretty much the same 
as they were when the Beatles were living, in, you know, as kids in the 40s and, and, and the 50s? Or has it changed a lot? The Dingles changed from when Ringo was growing up there. Bits of Wave Tree have changed where George was born and spent his first few years. That's mainly down to the housing because back then the houses uh, George and Ringo were born into had no toilets or bathrooms in the house. Pretty basic necessity. So most of those were modernised late 60s going into, into the 70s. So that changed. The other thing that has changed since I grew up around there was the community has been torn apart because they moved everybody out of all the streets around Madden Street where, where Ringo was born. And they moved them out over 10 years ago. And only now are they renovating the houses. So that wonderful community that was there when Ringo was there, was there when I was growing up there. All that has, has changed. So that, that, that's sad from a Dingle point of view. And I, you mm. can't get that back. Is, Street, it, is it still a poor but, area? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's still a poor area. Um, so socially, uh, economically, it's it's not changed much. Wavertree, where where George was born, again the same. Houses have been modernised, but the area is still quite similar. Speak, where George moved, and he ends on the sa- same estate as the McCartneys. That was a brand new estate, which was still being constructed when the Harrisons and McCartneys were moving on to there. So that that was still developing. Uh, and again, that, that is still quite a poor neighbourhood. Walton, however, for Mr. Lennon, has hardly changed. It is still like a sleepy English village, which could be anywhere in the rural countryside. Still a beautiful little village. Still very much in Liverpool, but not of it. And definitely middle class. Mm. So okay. that one's hardly changed. <laughs> All right. Guys, you have any more questions for, for David? I was sort of wondering whether, um, you know, Ringo doesn't tend to do a lot of interviews for books. Were you able to get to him? Oh, I wish. No, um, he doesn't, unfortunately. Because I would love to sit down and spend most of the time talking about the dingle. Um, (laughs) Because it fascinates me. It's interesting when you listen to the, the songs that Ringo brings out and he's telling his story through the songs. Going back to what I was just saying, if you look at the other side of Liverpool, and he says, no, I had to go to Stebble Street just to take a bath. <laughs> now, that's just a throwaway line, but I know what that means. Mm-hmm. Because for Ringo to take a bath, either brought in a tin bath from the backyard and put it in front of the fire, or he went down to Stebble Street, where they were, um, which is about a mile away from his house, where there were public baths, and you paid a couple of pennies, and they ran a hot bath for you. Um, <laughs> next to the public baths was a swimming pool, which is where I learned to swim. So when he says I had to go to Stebble Street just to take a bath, I know what that means. And anybody from the area will know what that means. Mm-hmm. So I pick up all the, all the local stuff. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to, to talk to him. I did have a really good conversation uh, with one of his uh, childhood friends, uh, Roy Trafford. Mm-hmm. And Roy was in the Eddie Clayton Skiffle group with, uh, with Ringo and is still friends with him now. They still keep in contact. And it, it was fascinating getting his input and his viewpoint on growing up with young Richie and what he was like. So that, that was about as close as I've been able to get. But yeah, obviously I'd, I would love to sit down with Ringo and, and talk the Dingle, talk Liverpool, talk drumming, uh, and, nice. and then talk Beatles. And that's one of the key things he wanted to do with this book because the book ultimately is about Ringo. It's finding the fourth Beatle. He's the, the guy, he's the drummer that John Paul and George, the Fab Three, they finally found the right drummer that fitted in musically as well as personality-wise and stayed with the group. And so ultimately it's the journey of going through various drummers, various crises and finding the right one. And it's, it's nice to concentrate, therefore, the Fab Four bit of the book without really talking much about John Paul and George, which obviously is no disrespect to them, but Ringo's always tended to be overshadowed uh, in Beatles books. Sure. And so he wanted to do something which wasn't overly technical, so it would lose people, but we wanted to bring those important elements of what made Ringo such a great drummer and why it worked. And, you know, even if he wasn't the first drummer to be asked, it's like with most of Beatles history, 
when something's meant to be, it happens. By hook or by crook, through this mad story, the four of them end up in the group, and it was the the right combination. It it just it worked. Mm-hmm. It made a difference, and it so that's what I really wanted the focus of the book to be about. Now, obviously, a lot of the revelation is, you know, as we discussed, is about the getting rid of Pete and all that, the legal stuff with that. But I, I haven't wanted to lose the focus that in the end. This is the journey of John Paul and George finding Ringo. Mm-hmm. And as we've said a number of times here, he was the final piece of the puzzle. Exactly. Yeah. Do you feel that generally speaking, he's beginning to get more respect now, um, you know, partly through the remasters, partly through, you know, the, the fact that um, I guess, well, your book will obviously have something to do with it and uh, the way Mark Lewis and told the story in Tune In, it, it was kind of clear that he was the most accomplished musician of the four at the time. I, you know, I, if you think back, I mean, for instance, on Saturday Night Live, there was a, a skit once with, um, it, it was really about Albert Goldman and it shows the Beatles in Hamburg and Goldman coming along and uh, joins them as a trombonist. And but but Ringo, the John Lovitz <laughs> plays Ringo, and his one line that he keeps repeating is, "You know, I'm just happy to be here." You know, and <laughs> and then when Ringo was a was the host on Saturday Night Live, they had an auction where you know they were auctioning Ringo off among a bunch of other Beatles memorabilia, and all of the questions <laughs> were like, "Well." Did John, Paul, and George touch that toothbrush that you have? You know, something, <laughs> yeah. that kind of thing. But you know, it, and and he's always had this sort of like jokey lack of respect, and yeah. I, I kind of think mm. that's beginning to change. And I was wondering if your perspective is the same. Absolutely, and it's something I noticed coincidentally around the time I'm starting to look seriously of putting this project together, which is about four years ago. Just suddenly noticed in the music magazines and before the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing happened, suddenly other drummers were coming out and saying how important Ringo was to them becoming a drummer and how he influenced them. And then suddenly, the, the, these last few years, he's finally getting credibility. And in a way, it's almost as if, if you're within the industry, Ringo's always had that. But for some reason, nobody's come out and said it. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe... They've got to that stage where he's been skitted and treated as a joke so many times. You know, how many people say, well, you know, he's the luckiest guy on the planet. Right. And some people in Liverpool will, will still say that, you know, he jumped on the bandwagon. It could have been anybody. He was just the lucky one. Again, you don't last for that long in a top group if you can't make it. Right. And <laughs> I think finally Ringo's getting some credibility. Um, and that really... What we want to establish with this book is don't write Pete off because of what he did, because what he did was great. But ultimately, what we're looking at is the recording career of the Beatles. Ringo was the right guy. He fitted in and he created and contributed so much to that process that he should be given credit alongside John Paul and George. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't just be, you know, the, what's the, the old musician's joke? What do you call the guy who hangs around with musicians? The drummer. <laughs> wow. And it's almost been a bit like that, that he's the jokey guy, he's the clown at the back, and nobody's taking him seriously because he was always the guy at the back. And Ringo's been happy with that. He's never wants to push himself forward and say, look at me. Maybe to his detriment, but you look at how many musicians, and particularly these top drummers, who come out and say, he's the guy we wanted to be. He's the reason I'm a drummer. We wants to play like him. Finally, he's getting some credibility, and I hope that's what this book will do. Is in a way, it'll make Beatles fans go back and listen to all those songs again, and listen for his drumming. Because um, what I did in the end, I picked out I think it's ten Beatles songs through the recording career where I think Ringo really stands out as a drummer. And I'll, I'll say to the reader, you know. These ones, I think, stand out. Uh, we've got Alex and Terry can comment from a technical point of view. But they only want to say, now go and listen to them. Do you agree? You know, it's subjective, but listen to the Beatles songs, to what Ringo was doing, and it, it'll change the way you listen to Beatles songs. Mm. We're not going to ask you for all ten, 
But would you mind giving us one of them and say why? I think the one, to me, because I, I play it so many, so often, it's Strawberry Fields Forever. Mm-hmm. You know, when you talk about playing the song, you know, his drumming is sort of, it's there, then it's not. And it's in the background. Then suddenly he's doing this great fill. Then it's in the background again. And he just knows the right time, when to put the right fill in, when to sit behind the song, when to be a bit further forward. And whenever I listen to it, I play air drums because I can't play the real thing. <laughs> but that, I always play air drums with, with his fills. I know exactly what he's doing with each one now. And I, I, I play with, with my air drumsticks and I just love his drumming in that. But you can pick Ticket to Ride. Again, his use of the toms on that, A Day in the Life. And of course, everybody's favourite B-side, Rain. Mm-hmm. I mean, musically, and for the whole band, it, it's brilliant, but uh, I love his drumming on that. Such a great song. Yeah, and like you said, not just the drumming, but the sound of the drums and what he got out of them too. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's one of the beauties of the remastering process, as, as we were saying before, of bringing the drums a little bit further forward. You're suddenly noticing all these subtle things that Ringo was doing in the background. Maybe you hadn't noticed before, but you can achieve a lot of that just by listening for, for the drums um, to the original songs. If you listen out carefully for them, you suddenly hear what, what he was doing. And you talk about newfound respect for Ringo. Mm. Yeah, uh, it certainly hasn't hurt him any for, to be highly visible most of the last 30 years with his all-star band putting together great, great shows. Oh, Absolutely. You know, and you can tell he still loves what he does and he knows his limitations as a singer. But, if, you know, some of the songs he's had, I mean, for me, Photograph is mm-hmm. probably my all-time favourite top five songs. It is just, it's a brilliant, brilliant song. I love it. Never yeah. play it, I would play it over and over again. But you, you look at it, just, he's just having so much fun with what he's doing. And if you think of the, of the health problems he had as a kid, you know, his appendix burst and he nearly died when he was seven. He got tuberculosis when he was about 13 and nearly died from that. He's had various other substance problems. And yet, look at him. How is that man so fit? <laughs> he, he just looks so healthy. I, I know. He's, healthy as he is. he's 25 years older than me and he looks better than me. <laughs> I'm not having it. it. Must be something in the dingle water. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's become an inspiration for us, definitely. Unfortunately, yeah. we've got to wrap things up here, but you just said that the book, Finding the Fourth Beetle, you're hoping yeah. will be out the first quarter of next year, and that's with the CDs, you said? Yes, yeah, there's going to be a double CD. There's just over 40 tracks. Any of the drummers that we mentioned through the story, as many of them who've recorded, we've got them on there. I even found Norman Chapman recording. Really? He made a yeah, he made a record with a group in Liverpool in um, the early 1970s, and it's like a Dixieland jazz. Oh, his drumming is just sensational. Absolutely mm-hmm. brilliant. And these are, you told me these are original recordings, correct? Just so that everybody yeah. knows, these aren't re- new versions. Um, these no, are no. the originals. Anything mm-hmm. really, anything really, 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 really rare? Uh, anything that we should be excited about? All in the one place. I'm excited to have the Sheridan recordings, the whole of the Decker audition. EMI audition and the Ringo Star Andy White ones on there. And I've got another version of Love Me Do by another Beatles drummer. Aha. Uh-huh. Mm. So mm-hmm. I've got four I've got Pete Best, Andy White, and Ringo Starr, and A another. <laughs> let me let, let, let me uh, emphasize what you just said there because in case somebody kind of ran, ran past people, you're going to have the DECA auditions and the yep. EMI auditions on that CD. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we think it's important because when, again, we're looking at, at the Decca audition, for example, and I've sat down with the record producer, Steve Levine, and whose observations are fascinating, they really are, and those three drummers. You go down track by track, and we get this overall conclusion. But what, what we're saying then to the reader is, don't just take my word for it, don't just took, take their word for it. Put the CD on, listen to the song, and see if you agree. Because okay. it shouldn't be. You know, don't just trust the word of an author if he's not a drummer. Mm-hmm. Right. I, and it, I, and it'll be the first place that, that some of these recordings have been legal again for a long time. Yeah, um, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry. 
How did you get clearance for this? Through uh, a music publisher who's licensed them. Okay. All right, Thank then. You. And the, uh, the documentary film you're hoping will be out by the end of next year? Yeah, that, that, that's the plan. Yeah, we've done a couple of little uh, preliminary sort of tasters um, and just a little bit of the basic stuff on the filming. Um, interestingly, we got Gally Astridge, who, of course, and I was like the curator of Ringo's kits, working <laughs> with Ringo on a, a number of projects. Great guy. Uh, and Gally was over in Liverpool uh, a few weeks back. Um, so we hooked up. And so we got him together with Alex Kane and Terry McCusker. And we got the three of them talking about, in particular, Ringo's drumming style. It was just a fascinating, fascinating time. So obviously bits of that will be edited, but that'll look really good in the film. So we're trying to have, we'll have a drummer's angle, but we'll have the stories as well. We'll have the, all, all the crises and everything like that. But yeah, we want to make it a, a good documentary feature film. Okay, and it's going to premiere uh, at where? Say the, the Fest for Beatle fans, or where exactly? Uh, it depends on timing. depends on when we can get the filming done and completed and edited. As you know, we've just finished uh, the Looking for Lennon documentary feature film, which we premiered at, at the Fest for Beatles fans. That is now going around the film festivals and individual rights have been sold to various countries around the world. Um, hopefully that'll get to television first and then onto DVD by next year. This is the first documentary I've been involved in, so it's a massive learning experience to make. But Roger Appleton, who was the director, and Gary Popper, who was the producer, again, the three of us are working on the Finding the Fourth Beatle documentary as well. Okay, and you were saying people can make a contribution to help out with the documentary? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, a page up at Indiegogo, um, which we've only just started. Um, at the moment, we're concentrating on the Pledge Music site for the books because we're self-publishing, so we're, we're taking pre-orders at the moment. We're going to do a 1,000 limited edition hardcovers, um, obviously signed by us. And Paul Skellett is the designer for that, who's done some fantastic books with Archivum, um, Eight Arms to Hold You, books like that, fantastic designer. And so he's he's working on that at the moment. And then obviously once we've done the limited edition, there'll be uh, the, the cheaper version, which will come out at some time next year as well, probably. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we've got to wrap things up here. Dave, if, if fans want to get in touch with you, is there a way they can do so? Yeah, if you want to find out more, particularly about the Find the Fourth Beetle project, you just go to thefourthbeetle.com, and that's fourth spelt, uh, not the number. So thefourthbeetle.com. And you can email through there, and I, I pick up the emails through there anyway. Um, or you can go to my own website, which is uh, davidabedford.com. All righty. Alan, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Probably the easiest way is on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. And Steve, how about you and, and for the show itself, too? You can get all of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Facebook page, uh, a personal Facebook page, and a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Information. Um, the show is, uh, you can email us at things we said today, uh, radio show at gmail.com. We definitely want to hear all your comments and questions and good things and bad things. We want to hear them all. Um, rate us on iTunes, please. Um, and um, we're also on Facebook, uh, Things We Said Today, uh, Beatles Radio Show. There's a second Facebook page uh, just said, just called Things We Said Today for the Fab Four radio broadcast. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Matt, uh, for that. And we're on Twitter at Things We Said Fab. Okay. okay, I tried to cram uh, that in as quickly as I could. <laughs> Go that's ahead. fine. Uh, David, uh, are you going to be at the Fest for Beatle fans in March? Oh, yes. Okay. So if yeah, any I, of you folks there. want to meet him. I know you've been you've been a regular there for, for quite some time, but I just wanted our folks to know that you'll be there this March. Yeah, bring your rotten tomatoes and everything else. I will be there. Throw them if you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I love it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to miss it. And uh, as for me, Ken Michaels, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething 
at att.net. I also have a Facebook page for Ken Michaels. And there's, of course, my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. There's Beatles trivia every single week where you can win one of nine prizes and a special contest periodically as well. And uh, uh, since Steve thanked uh, Matt at Fab Four Radio, just want to let you know that if you listen to Every Little Thing, you can hear both of our shows, Every Little Thing and Things We Said Today, back-to-back Sunday mm-hmm. nights at 11 Thanks. o'clock. So get a double dose of us <laughs> at uh, Fab4Radio.com. <laughs> hey, it's a cool thing for them to be Definitely. back-to-back. It's, it's been that way for a long time now. Yeah. Right. So, Dave, it's been great having you on the show, and, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be hearing from you again when the book Perfect. comes out. And uh, look forward to seeing you in March, too. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thanks. So, Thank you, Dave. So this has been great uh, chatting with David Bedford. And for Alan Cozen and Steve Marinucci and David Bedford, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and we will see you next time.